Hi to everybody who's joining. We'll get started in just a minute here as we wait for attendees to trickle in. Okay, I see the number of attendees rising, which is good, so we can get started here. Um, hello, everyone, and on behalf of myself and FairVote, I'd like to welcome you to this webinar to discuss the ranked choice voting effort in Evanston. My name is Rachel Hutchinson, and I'm a research analyst at FairVote and a native to a small town near Evanston. Uh, for those of you dialing in from out of town, Evanston is a wonderfully vibrant city just north of Chicago, and in November, the people of Evanston get to decide whether to, they would like to adopt ranked choice voting. I'm joined today by the mayor of Evanston, Daniel Biss. Uh, mayor Biss has also represented uh, Evanston in the Illinois State Senate. Uh, also, Andrew Silva, the executive director of Fair Vote Illinois, who has been paramount to the campaign to adopt RCV in Evanston. Um, and also, Brian Bosire, the former director of the community program at Fair Vote Minnesota, who has extensive experience ex campaigning for and implementing ranked choice voting. So with that, I'd like to give each of our panelists a minute to further introduce themselves and say your relation to what's happening in Evanston. Uh, let's start with Mayor Biss. Uh, yes, good afternoon. Thanks for uh, having me. I'm looking forward to the discussion. My name is Daniel Biss. I'm the mayor of the city of Evanston, which as was mentioned, will have on uh, its ballot this November, a referendum to opt into a ranked choice voting uh, system. So it's something that I've spent some time studying and thinking about. I just wanna say in advance that I'm uh, here to provide education and information about this. Uh, as in my role as mayor of the city, I do not advocate for or against a ballot referenda like this, uh, but uh, it, I may have the option uh, to, in my personal capacity as an individual, state some opinions later on if that becomes appropriate. But uh, once again, really very much looking forward to this conversation. Thank you. And let's go over to Andrew. Yeah, thank you. I'm, I'm the executive director of Fair Vote Illinois. Um, Fair Vote Illinois got started back in 2020. So in 2019, I started advocating for ranked choice voting. And we were a small group of, of highly energized advocates who thought, hey, we can make a difference. And so we got together and said, if we really want to make this happen, we need to organize. So in 2020, um, I actually quit my consulting job at uh, 14 years, at least temporarily, to uh, get Fair Vote Illinois off the ground. And we quickly started growing after that. So we have now um, thousands of supporters and volunteers, which is really amazing. And I really credit a lot of the volunteers for Fair Vote Illinois for being out on the street, canvassing, talking about ranked choice voting, because that's the real hurdle that we found for, for getting it passed. It's just getting people um, educated about it and aware that what it is and the benefits. So super proud of what we achieved mostly. A lot of shout outs to our volunteers. They're really incredible. Thanks, Andrew. And let's go over to Brian. Uh, yeah, again, uh, nice to meet everybody here as, uh, on the panel. Uh, my name is Brian Bosire. I um, um, live in Minneapolis, uh, on the border of Minneapolis rather than Brooklyn Center. Uh, I was invited here to come and speak about our experience um, using RCV in Minneapolis, St. Paul, and some of the cities that we use over here. And due to my um, my password, I uh, thought that I could come and share some um, some of the experience I've had in organizing around ranked choice voting. Uh, currently, I came back to just help out. Uh, on a part-time basis with some of the community engagement uh, that they're doing before the election, but um, glad to be here and speak a little bit more about our experience in Minnesota with RCB. Thank you, Brian. Yeah. Uh, so my first question I'd like to go over to Mayor Biss for. Uh, so I'd like to talk a little bit about what the referendum is and how it got to be on the ballot. So could you explain to us what exactly is the question that Evanston voters will see on their ballot in November? Well, I. Uh... In preparation for this, I do have the text in front of me. It's not enormously fun to read out loud, but I can I can go through it quickly. It, it reads as follows. Do you want Evanston voters to use ranked choice voting, also known as instant runoff voting, to elect the city's offices of mayor, clerk, and city council members beginning with the April 2025 consolidated election? If approved, this proposal would allow voters to rank candidates in order of preference in elections for mayor, clerk, and city council members. 
If voters still want to choose just one candidate, they can. A candidate who receives the majority of first choices would win. And then it goes on, that's about half of the, it goes on to essentially explain uh, how ranked choice voting uh, works. And it tries to kind of, in as concise a manner as possible, uh, define it and lay it out for the voter. Amazing. So um, to you, what is ranked choice voting and how does it work and how does it differ from sort of the current method of election for city council elections in Evanston? Well, let me say how we do it right now in Evanston, which is not the same as every place, uh, but it's uh, similar enough that it's going to sound familiar to folks. Uh, we have the city is divided up into nine wards. So there's 11 elected offices. There's the mayor, me, and the city clerk. We both run citywide. And then the other nine offices are for the nine city council members, each of whom run from their own ward. And when they file to run, uh, the election is in April, but if five or more of them uh, file to run, that triggers a special primary election that happens in February, where the top two vote getters move on to April. And if fewer than five file to run, then all of those, whether it's one or two or three or four, are all running at the same time in April and whoever gets the most votes wins. And so that means a lot of different things might happen. One thing that might happen is you've got two different elections and you've got to persuade people to turn out two different times to make their voices heard, once in February and once in April. Another thing that might happen is you might have, let's say three or four candidates on the ballot in that April election and someone could get elected with, you know, let's say 35 or 40% of the vote. And so the idea behind ranked choice voting is to say, let's not have two different elections, let's just have one. Let's not let anybody get elected with under half the vote. Let's say you gotta get half the vote. And the way to make that happen is that the voters don't just say, hey, my favorite candidate is Daniel. They say, I'm gonna rank my candidates. My favorite, let's say my favorite might be somebody else. My favorite might be Brian, but my second choice is Daniel and my third choice is Andrew. And then if when, when it comes time to count the votes, hey, well, if somebody gets a majority of the first place votes, they're elected already, it's a done deal. But maybe nobody gets a majority. Maybe, maybe it's a pretty close election and all three candidates get you know, around a third of the first place votes. Well, then what you do is you figure out who came in last and whoever voted, whoever picked that last place candidate as their first choice now gets to have their second choice essentially count for determining who wins the election. So it's, it's, a, it's a kind of a more complex calculation, but it results in a situation where the, you only got to hold one election on one day, and then the candidate who is actually put in office comes in with majority support. And so there's the, the idea is that there's less of a likelihood of somebody really being unable to govern because they got elected with only a small slice of the community actually supporting. Gotcha, and does that happen often? You get a lot of people coming into office with a mandate to a small, you know, less than 50% of their ward? You know, it doesn't happen that often. And one thing that was actually really interesting, you know, so, so you might ask, how did this thing get on the ballot in the first place? Well, the city council voted to put it on the ballot so that we had a, a vote a few months ago that said, hey, we want to put this thing on the on the ballot for the people of Evanston to decide whether we're, we're going to move forward with this new system. And one of the discussions, the back and forth that happened was some folks who were a little bit skeptical said, well, now, hold on. If you look at cities that have implemented ranked choice voting systems, like, for instance, New York City, or uh, we know there are examples in Minnesota, so we're going to learn about from Brian. If you look at those cities, the ranked choice voting system doesn't change the outcome that often. It's not like we're electing different people all the time. It's that there are some kind of borderline cases where it changes the outcome. Uh, and some people view that as a plus, you know, and say, hey, it's not, it's not the revolution, it's just a tweak to improve the system. Others might say, hey, that's, if it's not changing the system that much, what's the benefit anyhow? But, but it is important to note that you're, you're not looking at a situation where all of a sudden, two thirds of the elections are gonna come out differently. It's gonna make a really significant difference in that small slice of the elections that were already typically pretty closely divided. Gotcha. And you talked a little bit about how this was something that the city council put on the ballot. Uh, could you talk a bit more about that process? What did it take to sort of get ranked choice voting on the ballot in November and how long has it been in the making? Yeah, thanks, Rachel. And you know, every state is certainly different. In fact, many municipalities are even different. And some places have an initiative system where the people can just pass petitions and get something like this to occur. 
uh, in Evanston and in fact throughout Illinois, it's, it's usually not that simple. Uh, usually what has to happen is the city council itself or the village board or what have you has to put a referendum on the ballot. And so uh, the way it worked here in Evanston is a particular city council member, the ninth ward uh, representative, his name is Juan Hedicatis. He um, thought this was a great idea. So he, he introduced the concept and it got you know, drafted up and went through the committee process and committees had debates and there were a lot of uh, public meetings and you know, the, the city council members had meetings in their wards to kind of take the temperature of the community. At the end of all of that, it came to a vote of city council and city council voted with a strong majority to put it on the ballot. And that's why it's going to appear on the November ballot, at which point finally, if then, it passes with the majority of the votes of the people, then it's actually going to be in force. And in fact, the next municipal election that we have, which would be in uh, April of 2025, uh, would be conducted with a ranked choice voting system. Gotcha. So if passed next election, it will be used. Um, and which exactly type of offices and elections in the city are affected? Yeah, and this is a this is another confusing one for folks who happen to live here because we've got school boards and, and all kinds of different local elections people participate in. But as the city, we only have any say over the city itself. So this is literally for the city of Evanston elections exclusively for the mayor, the city clerk, and the nine members of city council and all the other local elected offices that people might vote on at the same time that the electorate might kind of think of in the same category they will still be under the existing system. Gotcha, great. Well, thank you. That was a wonderful snapshot for exactly what voters, what kind of decision they're gonna be facing in November. Um, my next question is for Andrew. Um, I'd like to discuss a little bit about what ranked choice voting could mean for Evanston. So to you, what are the benefits of ranked choice voting um, and why in your opinion should Evanston voters vote yes on the referendum? Yeah, and there, there are a lot of reasons to love ranked choice voting. So. I'll go through, I guess, a few that I, I think are really um, important. Um, one is, as Mayor Biss kind of alluded to, was in order to win a ranked choice voting election, you need support, at least in part, by the majority. So it, it drives elections to whoever gets elected eventually has to appeal a little bit more broadly to the electorate. Right now, I think there's a lot of frustration, probably an understatement, um, with politics in general, both locally and nationally. And, and it's, um, people feel like they're not being represented by the, by the people running sometimes, that they're appealing to their base only and not to the more electorate at large. So, so this is one way that um, the eventual winners of ranked choice voting elections um, better represent uh, the voters or the constituents. A really big important part is that it provides more choices to voters and often, often in a sense, better or more diverse choices as well. So today when you vote, um, if there's more than two people running, you often have to do a little calculation in your head to say, wait a second, is the person I'm voting for a viable? And if not, am I wasting my vote? Am I splitting votes from someone else? Am I spoiling the election? And these are questions that we really shouldn't have to ask ourselves. So at ranked choice voting, it's really simple from, your, from the voters' perspective, they just rank their candidates. I like this candidate first, this one second, this one third, and they don't need to worry about vote splitting because if my top choice can't win, if, they're, um, if they end up coming in last place in the first round of voting and no one has a majority, my vote automatically gets transferred to my second choice. So it, it really allows for more people to run. We get more diverse candidates running as well. And, um, and that just gives voters more power in the, the election. Um, and a, a third thing that I wanna bring up is the civility of elections. So right now there's a lot of negativity in politics and it's, it's very frustrating to the average voter. Um, with ranked choice voting, a candidate is incentivized to appeal to this broader portion of the electorate. So they can't be your first choice. They still want to be your second choice or they want to be your third choice. So it's not in their best interest anymore to do negative campaigns, to attack their opponents. It's much a much better strategy to focus more on issues and on the problems that are being solved. It's not going to end all negativity in politics. I'm not naive to say that, but it, it definitely incentivizes candidates to 
to um, focus more on issues and try to appeal to a broader portion of the of the electorate. Great. Um, and Mayor Biss touched a little bit about how Evanston currently has some quirky election rules about, you know, whether or not the primary happens. Uh, so he talked a little bit about this, but does ranked choice voting have any effects that will be especially beneficial in the context of Evanston? Yeah, I, I think what he touched on was exactly right. So right now it's a little bit of a quirky system where there's different rules for um, whether or not there's a primary for the mayor versus city council for how many people are running. Um, and then depending on how those election goes, whether or not it triggers a runoff, it's also a little bit different. And so there's also different timings that um, for, for filing for the candidates for each of those elections. So with ranked choice voting, it simplifies things quite a bit. There's just one election now, and that's great for voters. It makes it easier. They only have to show up for one election and vote which effectively increases voter turnout or, or tends to in, in place that adopt a ranked choice voting because you're only going to one election versus multiple. Um, it's great for candidates. They don't need to worry about campaigning for multiple <laughs> elections. They could plan more accordingly. And it's, it's great for the, for the people who administer the elections as well. It clears up all those filing dates, makes the administer, administering of the actual one election much, much easier as well. Great. Um, and if this measure passes in Evanston, what could that mean for the future of ranked choice voting elsewhere in Illinois? Yeah, there, there's a lot of support in Illinois across the board. And, and what Fair Vote Illinois does is really we're a grassroots organization. We're volunteer run. I'm a volunteer myself. Um, and we see support already at the state level. There, there were bills in the Illinois House and Illinois Senate. The Senate bill had eight co-sponsors, which was really encouraging. Um, the General Assembly session ended, so we do in anticipate that those bills will get reintroduced next year. Um, there's interest in other cities, and by Evanston being the first, it just makes it so much easier for those other cities to adopt as well. It makes it so much more likely that the state-level bills will actually pass as well. So it's a huge, huge boost to the rest other cities in the state, the state as is, is a whole, and then really to the country once Illinois passes ranked choice voting. Amazing. So Evanston could be somewhat of a trailblazer for Illinois then. Um, so relatedly then, I'd like to turn it over to Brian, who is doing a lot of trailblazing in Minnesota. Um, I'm curious about your experience uh, implementing RCV in major diverse cities. Um, first of all, just which cities have you worked to implement ranked choice voting in? So, um... So I actually came, uh, I, I began working for Fair Vote Minnesota in 2008. So 2018 actually, so Minneapolis and St. Paul had already kind of uh, been used the system for I think almost three election cycles, but I came on uh, when St. Louis Park, which is the third city that passed RCV in 2019. Um, and then uh, Manitowoc and Bloomington started in 2021. Uh, but I've done extensive work as far as um, continual education, which is something that we, we usually do a lot of uh, in Minneapolis, St. Paul, and just the cities they use it because again, we have such a high diverse uh, population. And usually, you know, right now we have a lot of people who move in and out of the city. So we find that that continual education and community, uh, community engagement aspect of it is very key and essential to kind of, um, again, always um, um, uh, teach new folks who are coming into the city and moving into the city how it works. They can actually, uh, rather, than, rather than just voting for one person, understanding the process itself and the benefits of actually ranking the whole ballot. So the continual education is very uh, important aspect of it. Gotcha. So as you're mentioning, the work sort of, it doesn't stop once the ballot measure is um, passed, it, it keeps going. So what has been, you know, from what you have seen in Minnesota and elsewhere, uh, what's it like working through issues of equity and representation um, in the implementation process in sort of the diverse cities that you've done uh, since Evanston likewise is a big diverse city? Yeah, yeah, definitely. That's a great question. And I think uh, for Fair Vote Minnesota, we've been very strategic uh, in having the right partnerships in the community, especially uh, as far as community leaders that we partner up with elected and non-elected. You know, these leaders have been almost like the validators in the community as trusted voices. So we invest uh, a significant time in creating those partnerships with also community organizations that have influence in certain communities, just to uh, 
uh, as a way to educate their members and their supporters. Uh, so we feel like those uh, relationships have been very key and, and instrumental in, uh, again, doing that education. Uh, also, another thing we do is, you know, our, because we have a, such a high diverse community in Minneapolis and St. Paul, especially, uh, we have a high immigrant population as well. So we usually try to have also uh, translated um, lead pieces that could, you know, that we can hand out to folks to kind of learn the process. So as you mentioned earlier, the education aspect of it is something that's continuous. Uh, so again, making those right partnerships in the communities are very, um, is a key to kind of keep driving the message and the education. Gotcha. And since you do a lot of the work sort of after the ranked choice voting has begun, um, what do we know about how it works in practice? Do people like it? Do people understand it? Are they liking the winners that come out of it? Yeah, I definitely say uh, people very much love it. Uh, you know, there's this notion that people say uh, that people who don't like RCV say that it's complicated and things like that. They use the argument to kind to, uh, again, uh, push people community and a lot of people find it very easy to use when you think about it actually you're always ranking something every day right so like you I prefer this shirt over this shirt over this shirt in case I'm able to get this then I you know we always continue rank, ranking so I think for us when we do the education with folks even from you know uh, first uh, first generation immigrant communities people get it very easy it's uh, it's just something that we have to invest heavily on education and being out in the community and having those conversations. And I believe uh, the people really respond to, you know, to understand, especially when I understand the benefits of what it aims to do and what it has done as far as, you know, um, uh, increasing um, candidates of color and women to actually run and win. So that representation aspect of it is very key in driving support. And also, uh, we usually have funny events, like not funny events, but really quirky Easy events like come rank your favorite ice cream, come rank your favorite candy. Simple events like that, you'd really be surprised how much uh, how much they drive the conversation and how much they bring folks in to kind of come learn exactly what are you guys doing and they understand it very easily. And then you, you know, and then it translates in the ballot, especially as uh, with all the findings that we've been finding as far as exit polls, people find it very easy to use. And uh, I should have pulled up the numbers from our website, but I could send anybody to the Fair Vote Minnesota website. Uh, we have uh, very uh, good uh, documentation of the exit poll numbers that suggest that people find it very easy to use and like it, and they actually want to see it, they want to see it more expanded for state elections as well. And have you seen that in practice that ranked choice voting has been empowering to these different sort of diverse communities you've been working with in terms of either getting more people to run or expanding sort of their influence on the outcome? Yeah, definitely. I, I mean, uh, one key, um, so maybe I could point out to uh, St. Paul and Minneapolis, right? So in St. Paul in 2017, uh, they had one of the highest turnouts uh, up to then at that time compared to 2013, there was 27% increase in voter turnout. And that year actually they um, elected their first uh, African-American mayor in the history of St. Paul. So that happened in 2017. Also in Minneapolis in um, 2013, Minneapolis elected a gender balanced city council um, and the second female mayor in Minneapolis history. Uh, they also elected the first Somali American, um, Latina, Hmong city council uh, candidates in Minneapolis history, which resulted in the most diverse city council up to that point. So we see a lot of uh, different trend as far as representation and diversity in the cities that, uh, that have been using it. Um, even recently in St. Louis Park, they finally, finally had, uh, I think they had a Somali um, young lady actually who ran for city council for the first time and won actually. So we, we're seeing a, the diversity aspect of ranked choice voting actually applying and that has actually been very uh, uh, convincing for voters to want to engage more and participate and love the system. Well, amazing. Um, have you seen any challenges sort of either in the adoption or implementation process um, and sort of any words of wisdom uh, for the people trying to do it in Evanston? Yeah, definitely. I, I think Evanston now has a um, as an advantage in learning from the cities that already use it, right? So a lot of cities like let's say Minneapolis, St. Paul have been using it for over a decade plus and we've uh, 
in a way that the word you guys use earlier, trailblaze. So you guys can learn a lot more, of, a lot from some of the things that we've done as far as I think uh, the key essential things that we've done very well is those community partnerships that we've made, uh, community validators, you know, people who can go and speak to their communities for them to understand the benefits of it. And, you know, and using case examples as uh, Minneapolis, St. Paul and other cities, they use it and uh, what it's done as far as diversifying uh, uh, positions of leadership, especially in city council and mayor and such, because sometimes people don't understand that uh, um, that our local leadership actually affects our lives more directly than the national leadership and such. So I think making those connections really um, um, is imperative and it makes voters actually understand how important it is to have uh, representation that, rep uh, that mirrors you locally and you know the um, how accountable they are to you in a way. Amazing. Well, it's wonderful to hear that Minnesota has had such success with ranked choice voting and really, you know, given hopefully some steam to folks who are trying to do it in other places like Evanston. Um, my next question, I'd like to turn back to Mayor Biss. Um, how can people in Evanston cast their ballot? Are there options for early voting or mail-in or what do people do to get out the vote in November? Yeah, thanks. And I want to stress that this is part of the regular November election. So I very much would hope that everybody votes in that election, irrespective of your view on any issue. This is a hugely important election. We'll be electing governor and attorney general and other constitutional offices, a US senator, uh, and more. So please turn out. Um, the election day is, you know, as per usual, the Tuesday that occurs between November 2nd and 8th. Uh, we have early voting across Illinois for, for a number of weeks leading up to the election, including, in fact, at the Evanston Civic Center. So in uh, City Hall in Evanston is an early voting location uh, throughout that early voting period. Uh, there's also now mail voting, uh, which of course has come in incredibly handy during the course of the, um, of the uh, pandemic. And uh, in fact, uh, you can apply online for a mail ballot. Uh, so Illinois has done a really excellent job of enacting a number of laws that, that uh, really make us one of the easiest states to vote. Uh, and I very much hope that everybody will take advantage of that opportunity and ensure they participate in this election. As we all know, um, this is not a presidential election. And so turnout tends to be a bit lower than it might be in 2020 or 2024. And it's, there's so many important things being decided. I would really very strongly urge everybody to make sure their voice gets heard. Thank you. Uh, now I'd like to go back to Andrew for a moment. Um, for people who are listening in and hear this and think, wow, I love ranked choice voting. I'd love to get involved and support the effort. Um, how could they do so? Yeah, so the biggest challenge we have with the ranked choice voting um, is that not everyone has heard about it. So when we talk to people, our experience has been there is overwhelming support when people know what it is and how it works. And so it, it's not a controversial, we think it's a real no brainer type of reform, tons of benefits. So, so the challenge has always been getting the word out. So ways to help are, um, we are out knocking on doors in Evanston to let voters know that it's gonna be on the ballot. We just, we're not selling anything. We feel like we're just giving information. This is what it is, how it works so that they can make the most informed decision. And, and again, overwhelmingly people see it's a good idea and they they tend to support it. So um, coming out and volunteering is a huge way of, of reaching people and, and helping. Um, phone banking, we're doing that every week as well. So we can't knock on doors or you're, you're not willing to go and knock. Um, making phone calls, that's a big way of helping. And then the third would really be uh, making a donation. We're trying to, for people that we can't reach, like face-to-face, -face, which is the best, or on the phone, which is next, we at least want to get some information to them. And so sending out a mailer costs money, there's postage. We'd like to get some information to voters in Evanston and, and any contribution helps get those mailers out to more people. And so for all of that, there is a campaign website. It's rcv4evanston.org. And I encourage people to go to that website. It would go directly towards the efforts in Evanston. So that's a separate um, ballot committee. That, that runs that website. So it's everything that is donated to that goes specifically for Evanston. There's an events page where you can RSVP for canvassing or for phone banking. 
Amazing. Lots of ways to get involved. Thank you. Um, so we're running a bit ahead of schedule. So I'm going to take some questions out of the Q&A here. Um, first one, uh, this can go to anybody really. Um, so there have been some sort of big RCV elections, notably in Alaska and New York City. Um, have they been sort of a positive or a challenge as the team has tried to teach people about the initiative, sort of having these other examples to look to? Um, Andrew? Sure, sure, I could I could speak to that. Um, overall, I think it's it's been a, a positive. It's mostly been here's exposure to ranked choice voting, what it is, and it, it helps us have these conversations. And that that's a big challenge. Um, one thing that we're very careful with, Fair Vote Illinois is a nonpartisan or organization. Ranked choice voting inherently does not help one side or the other or anything like that. So it's it's really great that we have two states right now that have ranked choice voting statewide, Maine and Alaska. One's a little bit left leaning, one's a little bit right leaning. Um, it's really great to see the results out of uh, New York City. It's a lot of data we could point to. Um, particularly, they did an incredible job with their their voter education. Um, Ninety five percent of of um, voters said it was easy to use, and that was their first time ever using ranked choice voting. So it's really, really encouraging some of the things that we see out of these places that we could point to and, um, and you know, ease concerns others have about um, ranked choice voting being implemented here. Great, thanks. Um, we have another person asking, um, how is the initiative doing or how is it polling? So I, I'm not sure if there are actual polls out there, but um, Andrew or Mayor Biss, from what you've seen locally, is there excitement on the ground about it? Are people feeling generally excited and optimistic? Well, there definitely are not polls. Um, I, I ran a whole campaign for mayor and never had any data until the, re the final results came in. So we don't usually have a culture of polling here in a small town like this. Uh, I'll say two things though. One is there's a lot of interest and a lot of enthusiasm. And the other is there's a lot of questions. And I think Andrew is right on the money that this is, this is new for people. Uh, it's something that um, people haven't necessarily learned about or thought about or grappled with. Uh, and I think people, uh, and I really appreciate and respect this, people want to make an informed decision. They understand that the way that we select our city leadership is going to be important in determining what kind of city leadership we have. And so people are looking for, for information and examples. I do think looking at other communities across the country that have enacted this has been helpful to folks. Uh, and I think having sessions like this that just put information in front of folks to give them uh, as much of a kind of base of knowledge to draw from when making up their mind uh, is really valuable. I, I think people are glad the election is not tomorrow because they, they still want to educate themselves and figure out how to how to approach this issue. Great. Um, the next question I'm going to answer, or have one of you answer, um, is, is there sort of an estimate about if running sort of this one RCV election instead of in addition to the primary or runoff that might happen, does that save the city a significant amount of money? We can go first to um, Mayor Biss and then maybe Brian, if you've seen similar sort of cost saving things in Minnesota. Uh, well, it doesn't save the city a ton of money, partially because the city itself is not doesn't have the primary responsibility for holding elections, uh, though even just, you know, keeping municipal buildings open longer and so forth winds up with some indirect costs. So it's not a huge cost uh, saver to the city itself, uh, though perhaps the all in savings to the taxpayer, if you add up the different layers of government might be greater. Uh, also, obviously, every little bit uh, can potentially at least count. Great. Um, over to Brian, if you've seen any ways it sort of saved either financial things or, you know, more administrative costs in Minnesota by implementing ranked choice voting. Yeah, yeah. So uh, definitely that has been, a, you know, um, a really um, um, a key feature of ranked choice voting. And I think a lot of cities, uh, maybe I can just point out to one city, uh, Brooklyn Park. Uh, so it's a city that's been kind of looking at using ranked choice voting, they still haven't done so. But one of the main thing that, uh, you know, attracts ranked choice voting to that city also is because the competitiveness of the mayor races, right? So they had uh, a recount in the last mayor election that they had. So they just understand that if they had ranked choice voting, then they would not have to be in a situation where, um, you know, 
to have a rerun. So a lot of cities are looking into using ranked choice voting in Minnesota because of that primary reason also that it saves the city a lot of money by not having to worry about running a primary. Also, I think for Bloomington, which uh, chose to use ranked choice voting in 2021, also that was another key point to why they wanted to use ranked choice voting. It was a selling point to voters that, you know, it would save the city a lot of money. And again, um, only a small size of the population usually attend the primaries, which again, it was, um, it, it was a good uh, selling point to voters that they saw that, yeah, we could save money rather than having only about 5% of the population decide who ends up on the ballot. We could just roll that over to uh, the general, uh, the, the election in November. So yeah, I, I could say that uh, it's been a continuing trend about saving money by getting rid of the, getting rid of the, getting rid of the primaries rather. Great. Um, we have a couple more questions coming in for Brian, specifically about sort of the impact that ranked choice voting uh, has on, you know, minority candidates running and winning, um, or, you know, their experience with the ballot. I know you touched on this a bit earlier, but just sort of any additional thoughts or evidence, to, or evidence that come out of your experience um, so far. Oh, yeah. Could you repeat the question? My friend got, uh, my internet froze for a couple of seconds, so I missed it. Yeah, sure. So you have a few people in the chat um, asking sort of does ranked choice voting impact minority candidates ability to run and win um, and also, you know, sort of experience actually with the ballot and understanding it and using it uh, to its fullest effect. Yeah, definitely. Uh, so to answer the first question, yes, uh, we've seen that, you know, it does have a great impact in having candidates of color and women actually uh, run and win. Um, I think I, I think I did point out to uh, um, you know, in actually, I probably uh, did not mention this, but in Minneapolis in 2017, a woman or a person of color won 12 of uh, the 22 races that are on the ballot. Uh, so we can see just how uh, how big of a um, in uh, how big of a platform it was for candidates of color to run and actually win without you know worrying about name recognition. So as long as they went out and actually talked to voters about. Uh, issues that impacted the community and kind of really sold their platform. Uh, it was giving candidates uh, that opportunity to actually win. And we've been seeing that as a trend that is ongoing actually. Um, and then um, the second part of your question was regarding um, Sure. Uh, just sort of experience with the ballot. I know you mentioned earlier uh, that you've seen polls that say, you know, a strong majority of voters uh, really understand ranked choice voting and they like it. Um, do you find that to be true across different communities? I am really sorry. My internet froze for the oh. last portion of the question. No, no problem at all. So um, uh, just talking about sort of the polls that you've seen that have expressed that people in Minnesota really like ranked choice voting, they understand it. Uh, do you find that to be true sort of across different communities or is it, you know, a stronger resonation with some communities than others or is it pretty universal? Uh, I would say it's pretty universal uh, based on the numbers because again, uh, I would say Jean Massey, the fair vote uh, executive director, she really puts a you know, heavy emphasis on community engagement. So anywhere there's our community uh, engagement opportunities, we usually, you'd find staff or volunteers there doing education. So uh, I think uh, maybe learning from early on in the trend in Minneapolis and how diverse Minneapolis was, I think she, this is something she's been really ahead of as far as really making sure that we have folks on the ground uh, doing community education uh, about how ranked voting works and what the benefits are. Uh, the benefits of the system are. And also I think the partnerships with local cities and, um, you know, uh, dispelling information to residents. Uh, and um, again, just the, the big component of it is just the continuous education and presence at community engagement events to drive up that uh, uh, education aspect of how the ballot works and the benefits of actually ranking the whole ballot rather than just voting one or two people. So just really, really uh, educating voters on the depths of the benefits of the system itself and also making sure that you rank your ballot entirely. Great. Uh, this next one I'll turn over to Andrew, um, which is kind of related to what Brian just said. Uh, what is Fair Vote Illinois doing so far or has is planning to do in the next month in terms of voter education or maybe even after the ballot measure is hopefully passed, uh, what comes next? Yeah, so, so thanks for the question. Um, Fair Vote Illinois has been out in Evanston for well before this referendum was put on the ballot. 
And we've been engaging with various groups. We do presentations for community groups. Um, we've been out at farmers markets talking to anyone who will speak with us for, for years now. Um, we're doing door-to-door -door education now. And one of the features, I, I think this is a big feature of this referendum is that it wouldn't go into effect until 2025 in Evanston. And, and that's that's by design. We want a little bit of time, both for the county clerk staff time to, for the implementation and for additional time, way abundance of caution to make sure we're doing this community effort to still talking to voters, um, going to you know retirement communities, going to places that we can't access otherwise to make sure, sure people know what it is. And so that, that will continue. It has been going on for a while now. We've also done some uh, events similar to what uh, Brian mentioned before. We did a Rink Your Beer event, a Rink Your Dessert event. Um, we have some other Rink Your um, Ice Cream-ish or, or different events like that on, on the horizon as well. All great ways of just showing how Rink Choice voting works. And that, that's going to continue. Um, we also have lessons learned from places like Minnesota and New York and the types of outreach they've done. So we already have materials from those groups that are translated to different languages. Um, and, and we have phone banking so that we could speak with different communities, all, all a variety of ways to get the word out. And we're gonna keep pursuing that. Great. Um, and somebody had another question that would be good for you, Andrew, um, sort of about ranked choice voting and results reporting. Uh, so let's say, you know, the measure passes and we're looking to 2025 and we have the first ranked choice voting election in Evanston. Um, what can people expect in terms of results? You know, can they be calculated instantly? Is there going to be a bit of delay? What will that sort of look like? Yeah, so um, there may they may take a little bit longer to get results with the ranked choice voting election. That That is possible. So um, depending on how close the race is and how if, if we get the first choice election results and we know a winner, okay, we, we, we likely know a winner like we do today if, if we know in the first choice. For close elections, we're gonna have to make sure we have all the votes in so that we could do that second round of, of counting. So we're gonna have to know, um, have enough time to collect those votes so we could eliminate the last place candidate and redistribute. So. It may be that we have to wait a little bit longer in some cases, and we're okay with that. I think most voters are okay with that, um, but it's it's um, to ensure that we get the right most most favorable candidate um, eventually elected. Gotcha. So it's more about sort of if it's a close election and you have like late ballots coming in, it sort of that more thing rather than the tabulation of instant runoff itself. Yeah, the, the tabulation is instant, right? Like we we, we have we have very reliable um, uh, voting equipment that tabulates the results. We could we could do that instantly. It's it's about allowing enough time for mail in voting and collecting all the votes before we give a, a total final you know official count. Great. Um, I'll direct this next question towards Mayor Biss. Um, so somebody is asking sort of about how incumbents or people who currently are elected under an old system might feel about this. Um, naturally, some politicians will think, I like the system I'm elected under. It's what got me elected. Why should I want to change it? There are other politicians that are kind of like, well, it would be great to go into office with a majority mandate for my constituents. So you express that, you know, the council must have liked it enough to put it on the ballot for voters to decide. Um, I'm not sure how much you can speak to this, but in your experience, is it something that's, you know, generally welcomed by people who would be elected by it? Um, or is it just sort of, we want to let the people decide and, you know, that that's great, whatever they pick. How was the reaction been sort of um, from the city council or other people involved? Well, you know, when I was in the Illinois Senate, I introduced legislation to try to advance ranked choice voting. And the attitude from my colleagues was, that's really cute, buddy. But we, we know how to win in the system that got us here. And we're going to, we're going to keep it that way. Thank you very much. Uh, I didn't even get a real hearing or a, or a committee vote, much less have a chance to pass that bill. So the thing that you point out is a real issue for political reform across the board, right? The people who've been elected tend to think, well, I'm pretty good and the system picked me, so the system must be pretty good. Um, as you said though, the referendum to uh, consider ranked choice voting in Evanston was, was uh, put on the ballot by an overwhelming vote of the Evanston City Council. Um, 
you know, just like I indicated that as mayor, I, I don't weigh in on this, uh, though I can weigh in in my kind of personal non-mayor capacity. The council members are in the same kind of situation. So you can, you know, you could ask them one at a time, you know, hey, human being who also happens sometimes to be on the city council, what do you, what do you think about this? And, and they may, they, they may want to, you know, to share that with you as long as they're doing it in the appropriate context. My guess is that most folks who vote to put in the ballot support it and will vote for the referendum as well. Um, and I think part of that is a level of confidence they probably have that they're doing the right thing for their wards. And so they'll be able to get reelected under any system that we might uh, produce. And part of it is under a sense that, you know, it's worth taking a political risk to try to build a system that does the most faithful job of reflecting the will of the public. You know, democracy is uh, sacred and imperfect, right? It's a funny combination. We take it unbelievably seriously. We revere the concept of democracy, but the actual system that we have in place, whether it's the mechanism of tabulating and scoring elections or even the election law we have itself is not perfect and constantly requires overhaul and update and rethinking and improvement. Uh, and I think that uh, public service minded elected officials are willing to think that through in an open-minded, honest way, even if it may not be the best possible thing for their own personal re-election chances. Gotcha. And so as an elected official, how, you know, let's say ranked choice voting is passed, how might that sort of ballot data that comes in, you know, seeing these are the first, second, third choice preferences of my electorate, how might that sort of inform you and your ability to, you know, campaign um, or pass legislation for Evanston? Is that something that would be helpful or more confusing or what, what does that sound like to you? I don't know. Uh, it's really interesting to contemplate and we may have the opportunity, you know, if this referendum passes and if I'm reelected mayor uh, to, to govern with that additional information. Um, but I think, I think in general, any data that you can get from the electorate about what their preferences and views are is something that can be helpful in governing. I think that a local elected official had better be damn humble about the fact that, you know, in my case, I live in a town of 78,000 people and something like 10,000 of them voted in my election. And so we are dealing with imperfect information. We are dealing as we are trying to interpret that election result and then use that information to govern. We're dealing with, you know, less information than one might wish to have. And so every additional scrap of information can potentially be helpful. And I would hope that if this passes, then you know, after April of 25, when we have that additional, those additional layers of information, the folks who are elected in that new system will make use of it to govern in a way that is yet more reflective of what the people are looking for. Great. Um, we have another question uh, from somebody who is saying, you know, some of their family members in Evanston hadn't heard of this before. Um, so I know Andrew mentioned, you know, the advocates locally are doing a lot of work to get people informed. Um, does any of like the city government agencies take on the responsibility of, you know, like informing people what this ballot measure is about, or is it more kind of we're neutral on it? How, how does that work uh, from your perspective, Mayor Biss? Well, we are neutral on it. So the city will not encourage people to vote yes or no, uh, should not, uh, will not. Um, the city will uh, continue to send information out through our channels. Obviously we don't have a giant budget for it, but we have a lot of digital channels, a big email list and a website. Uh, and we'll do, we'll do what we can afford beyond that as well. Uh, with information that is um, really striving to be neutral and fair and state the arguments on both sides in a way that is, uh, reflective and faithful to what folks on both sides really believe and, and, and mean and think and say uh, to get as much information as possible out there. And, and I recognize that not every voter may arrive at the polls feeling like they've gotten as much information as they would like, but we're gonna do our very best to get that information out there. I also wanna uh, give a uh, shout out to something that Andrew said, there's education before the election. And then if, if it passes, there's lots more education between then and the first election during which it would be used. And our commitment needs to be to educate people in a neutral way about what this referendum is about between now and early November. And then if it passes, to educate people in a practical way about what it means for them as voters with a different 
type of opportunity to express their preferences on a ballot starting in April of 2025. Great, thank you. Um, I'll direct this next question towards Andrew. So somebody has asked sort of about the relationship between ranked choice voting um, and gerrymandering and if it solves any of those problems. So I know that this measure um, to implement ranked choice voting doesn't affect sort of the way the district's awards are drawn in Evanston. Um, but as we know, gerrymandering can serve to make sure some votes sort of are more diluted or don't count as much as others. Uh, so can you speak well? You know, is there any relation to those things, or you know, does it help sort of minimize or mitigate any of the effects that gerrymandering can have, either you know, in Evanston or in other places that um, have implemented it? Yeah. So the um, statewide bill that was that was introduced into the Illinois State Senate would use ranked choice voting for both primaries and the general election. And in many ways, in some very gerrymandered districts, just the reality of it, we, we kind of know which party is very, very, very likely to win before the election. Um, and so having that ring choice voting in the primary um, is really valuable in that it brings more voters out in theory, and you get a candidate that represents that district that is more, um, better represents, you know, the demographics or the population of that district. So it's not going to solve, it's not going to solve sort of which are like how each party falls within each district, but it should get someone who better represents that district as a whole, rather than an extreme of the district is, is one way of looking at it. And so, so that's the hope with ranked choice voting. It's, it's why I was really glad that um, Senator Laura Murphy amended the original um, Senate bill to include primaries as well as the general, because in some some cases, for just the reality of it, the primary is the election for for all intents and purposes. And so, so it's really great that um, people could use ranked choice voting and get at least the most preferred candidate out of that that election. Gotcha. Um, and we have another question about sort of the greater Illinois movement. Um, somebody asked, you know, is there any way to do a statewide RCV bill as a citizens initiative? My understanding is it has to be passed through um, the legislature. But is there anything, you know, the people in Illinois can do to sort of encourage their representative to get involved or learn about ranked choice voting or support it? So I would say just to give a very, very wonky answer here. Um, Illinois has very limited um, citizen initiatives, essentially, to to amend uh, to, to 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 amend state law or the constitution. But the exception, and there is an exception, is for the structure and procedure of the general assembly itself. So the idea here is we elect our legislators to go do the thing, and so we don't need to have you know citizen initiated referenda because we've elected our legislators to go do the thing. Oh, hey, but wait. If the legislature is irretrievably broken, then the residents need to be the fail safe. And so the idea is all that we can do as residents of Illinois is initiate by petition a uh, constitutional amendment that's about the structure and procedure of the General Assembly. Now, I am no lawyer, and I can tell you that the, what, that, what those words mean, structure and procedure of the General Assembly, has been heavily litigated. And if you want to kind of go down this path, you should talk to your lawyer friends, or maybe you're just your lawyer. Um, but you could make an argument that if you're talking specifically about elections for the state legislature, uh, a change to those election systems to implement ranked choice voting, uh, there could be you know, part of a structure and procedural reform to the General Assembly. But certainly that wouldn't apply to local elections, it would apply to legislative elections exclusively. And so the other approach to this is just to call your state legislator, to call your state rep, to call your state senator, uh, to make the case and say, if you believe that to be the case, that, that it really um, is something that is important to you in assessing the way in which they do their job as your representative to uh, that they uh, advance an effort in Springfield to give you as a voter this additional way of making your voice heard. 
Great. Um, well, I think we have got through almost all of the questions in the chat here. So maybe we could um, wrap up a few minutes early. Um, but I just would like to give a huge thank you um, to our panelists, Andrew, Brian, and Mayor Biss, um, for taking your time to come and chat with us today and inform everybody about what's going on in Evanston. Um, I encourage you, if you live in Evanston, to get out and vote. Um, I encourage you, if you live in Illinois, to, you know, express your opinion to your legislatures about how you'd like your elections to be run. Uh, so thank you again uh, all for joining us. This was great. Uh, thank you so much.